Father God in heaven, it's in the name of Jesus the Christ we come. Lord, we thank you for another chance to come together. We thank you for your mercy and your grace. We thank you, Father God, for blessing us and keeping us. Now, Lord, we've come, Father God, asking you to forgive us for our sins. We ask you, Father, to purge us from our sins. We pray, Father God, that you bless us on tonight, that, Father God, we will understand your word clearly, that your word will speak to us. Lord, we thank you for your word. We ask you to bless us tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank God. One more time. God has allowed it one more again, and I'm glad about it. He has made a way out of no way one more time, and we are here again. Isn't, that, isn't God good? Amen. He is awesome, and he is the amazing, he is the amazing God, isn't he? Yes. He's allowed us one more time, not because we deserve it, but because he's so good. He has blessed us one more one more time. We are in Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8. We'll begin with verse number 1 and see how far we can get. Amen. Acts chapter 8. The Acts of the Apostles chapter number 8. Acts of the Apostles chapter number 8. If you would share this video, if you would share all videos, if you would be kind enough to share so we can evangelize the world, amen? amen. Your sharing will um, will allow us to reach more people. So if you would just share, uh, just hit share now. How about that? Amen, amen. Bless the name of the Lord. Acts chapter 8, beginning at verse number 1. We recall dealing with the book of Acts. And um, we realize in Acts chapter 1, the Bible says, After the Holy Ghost has come upon you, you will be witnesses unto me, and you will spread it throughout the world. Amen? And our testimony is that testimony of Jesus Christ, of his story, his death, burial, and resurrection. And we believe the story of Jesus Christ will save mankind. We believe if we're going to be saved, it will be no other way but through Jesus Christ. So we are in Acts chapter 8. This is right after the deacons were created in Acts chapter 6, when there was discrimination or said to be discrimination in the local church. And you know there should be no discrimination in the church. Amen? If there's going to be discrimination, it should never be in the church. But realistically, they're said to have been discrimination in the church in Acts chapter 6. The apostles looked at the church members and says, Look out among yourselves and choose from for yourselves seven men of good report, seven men that have a good reputation, seven men that are full of the Holy Ghost, seven men who love the Lord. Amen? So we want to make sure that these Apostle was saying that they want to make sure that we don't leave the serving of the word in order to serve tables. They're saying that the word of God is so important, we cannot afford to leave the serving of the word in order to serve the people. Now, it's not saying that the preacher should never serve the people. It's not saying that the apostles did not want to serve the people. But the word of God was spreading in such a great and powerful way. It has been said by many that the church at her birth was the church at her best. The church at her birth was the church at her best. So the seven deacons or the seven servants, the Greek word diakone, the seven servants were chosen. They were chosen from among the people. They were not chosen from among the apostles. They were chosen from among the people. And they brought them to the apostles, and then the apostle gave their approval. How do we choose deacons today? How do we choose? 
how do we dig, how do we decide? Do we decide based on how much they give? Do we decide deacons based on how close they are to the people of the congregation? Do we choose deacons based on how close of a relationship they have to the pastor? Do we choose deacons based on what? What do we choose deacons based on? What have you what have you seen or heard the way deacons are chosen? Every church seems to be different. Every church seems to be different. So I'm just plucking out the audience. They just <laughs> <laughs> they just pluck them out the audience. My my my. So, do they have any particular format? The way they do it. So remember, the church, the book of Acts is a historical book, right? The book of Acts sets the standard for our today church. And we ought to follow the book of Acts. We ought not just be plucking them out of the congregation. <laughs> it's amazing to me uh, when we were, when we were uh, itinerary preachers. It was 21 of us at the Holman Street Church. It was 21 preachers at the Holman Street Church. Then you have to pass. So if you missed it when you got up, it may be five years before you preach again. So we were able to seek preaching opportunities other places. And one particular church we would go to and I would preach and the other guys would preach at the same church and the pastor was very kind. And... We went there one Sunday, and a guy joined the congregation. He joined the church. We been, went back next month, and he was a deacon. So did they just pluck him out of the congregation? Well, maybe the or do we need men to join the church that badly? Another preacher and I told him, I said, man, this is the guy that joined last month. Now he's a deacon. The Bible, the Bible gives distinct characteristics of how we should choose deacons. Let's look at verse number five, Acts chapter six. In the saying, this the saying is is talking about choose ye among the people that will handle this business, that will serve the tables, that will stop the discrimination. So deacons are chosen to put the fire out, not to start the fire. They are chosen to, to get rid of the discrimination. They are chosen to settle the problems. They are not chosen to make the problem bigger or, or put flames on the fire, or put more wood or ammunition on the fire. So they had a problem. Verse number five, Acts chapter six. In the saying, which saying? Choose seven men full of the Holy Ghost that would handle this business. So they, they chose Stephen. What the other ones they chose? They chose Philip. The key two here are going to be Philip and Stephen. Because Acts chapter 7 and Acts chapter 8 is going to handle, are going to handle those two right away. And these guys, even though they were deacons, they had the ability to share the word of God. And if you're full of the Holy Ghost, you ought to be able to share the word of God. We ought to be able to share the word of God. If you're saved, we all are called to evangelism. Some may say that's not my calling. But it is your calling. We're all called. So let's look at Stephen first and then we look at Philip. Stephen was accused of blasphemy. Stephen began to talk about Jesus. He began to stand and proclaim the word of God about Jesus. And because he proclaimed the word of God, what did they do? They stoned him to death. They stoned him. They killed him. Stephen began to talk about Jesus and how you people killed him and, 
And he's talked about if you're going to be saved, you got to be saved through Jesus Christ. This was cutting into their belief that the Jews were special people. Here Stephen is talking about Jesus being the only way. And talking about everybody's on the same level. As we say today, everybody sits at the same foot of the same cross. So we will look at verse 54. Through the end of that verse, we will find them stoning Stephen because of Jesus. It says to us tonight that even when you're right, folk will do you wrong. You believe that? Even when you're talking about Jesus, folk will do you wrong. They stoned Stephen to death. Stephen looks up toward heaven in the midst of his dying. And what does he see? He sees Jesus Christ standing on the right hand of the Father. We know that Jesus is sitting on the right hand of the Father. Jesus is making intercession for us. But, but Stephen, full of the Holy Ghost, Stephen is being stoned to death for what is right. And it says, in verse 55, it says that he looks up into the glory and he sees Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Acts chapter 6, verse 55 says he sees Jesus standing up. Jesus is giving his approval. Can God, can Jesus give approval to you? Is Jesus giving his approval to you? Are you doing things? Are you doing things? Are you doing things? that Jesus is in approval of. In Acts chapter 7, Acts chapter 7, verse 55, Stephen looks up and sees Jesus. Standing on the right hand of the Father. He sees Jesus standing. And he still dies. What does it say to us? When we stand firmly for Jesus, it may cost us our lives. Dr. King preached his own eulogy. He says, I may not get there with you, but we as a people will reach the promised land. We will get to the promised land. I may not be marching beside you. He says, because I've been to the mountaintop. I've looked over into the promised land. I may not get there with you, but I guarantee you we as a people will get to the promised land. A few hours later, he was dead. There is always somebody who is willing to make sacrifices for us. We walked in this room, nice building. We, walk, we drove nice cars. We rode on nice roads. We drank out of nice water fountains. Somebody made sacrifices for that. Somebody need to tell our young people there were great sacrifices made so you can do what you do. So you can go where you go. So you can go through the front door instead of the back door. So you can sit on the front seat instead of the back seat. Not only are we sitting on the front seat, we're driving the whole bus. Amen. Let me just tell the story. It's kind of comical, but lady driving bus one day, a bug started crawling on her shoulder. A lady of a light colored hue was sitting on the front seat behind her. She's driving the bus. The bug crawled up her arm. The lady started pushing the bug around. Bug light back. He crawled up high. The bug, she pushed the bug again. The driver just driving. She's, she's not saying anything. 
And the third time she swung at that bull, she said, leave him alone. We can't have nothing for y'all. You get that later. So leave, leave him alone. See, we're at the point now where we have, or think we have, arrived. But the fact of the matter is, without Jesus, we have nothing. When I move from verse uh, chapter number seven to chapter number eight, there's a fellow called Saul. And Saul was on a mission. What was Saul's mission? Killing Christians. Killing folk. Killing what folk? Christians. Christians. Why was he killing Christians? I mean, we are meek and we're mild. We're not hurting anybody. Why would he kill Christians? He actually believed that they were in the wrong and he was in the right. He actually believed that they were an offense to God. It says to us today, just because you're doing what you think is right, doesn't mean it is right. I look at some people that just get caught up and so, so caught up in what they're doing until they really think they're doing the right thing. But when you look at scripture, you have to be on a level, plain, simple ground with human beings in order to do the right thing. You've heard the phrase, so holy, so heavenly minded, they're no earthly good. Well, they're only good and you're only good on planet earth because of Jesus. Even though they caught up in the clouds, even though they see things that we don't see, and even though they seem to be so holy that, that they can put us to shame when it comes to spirituality, the fact of the matter is we all are on the same plane when it comes to Jesus. So here's Paul. He really believes you. Have you ever seen anybody going the wrong way, down the wrong road, doing the wrong thing, and really believe it right? And they're going to convince you they're right. Yep. Have you seen it? Have you seen a person just, just in full blast, getting all into it, and they really think they're right, and you like, no, that, ain't, that doesn't sound right. Matter of fact, that doesn't line up with the word. Saul was convinced that killing Christians was the right thing to do. So if we honor God, is it ever right to kill somebody? Oh, I better ask that question in here. Is it ever right? I'm going to just tell you, I am guilty when I hear the news and, and someone broke in somebody's house or someone robbed somebody and one of them got killed in the process. I am guilty because the first thing I wonder, did the right one die? Can y'all counsel me tonight? How many of you thought that way? Is there a right one to die? So, Brown, is there a right one to die? You're sitting at your car, you minding your business, you get out to pump gas, and they just take over things. Is there a right one to die, Sister Woods? Are all of them, all of us special to God, right? God loves everybody, right? Yeah. Is there a right one to die, Brother Matt? <laughs> I'm not on this island by myself. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Proverbs says, if you don't do it God's way, if you don't listen to instructions, then your life is going to be cut short. If you don't do it God's way, you don't listen to instructions, your life is going to cut short. There's a viral video out there of this guy punching a lady in the face. And then he says, shut up. If you don't shut up, I'm going to knock you out. And he punches her in the face again. Then he beats her. And her 14-year-old boy shot and killed him. Did the right one die? <laughs> he should have died if he did. <laughs> should the boy be prosecuted or should the mother be prosecuted? He was at the point where he's going to kill her. And just because you bigger, badder, and stronger doesn't make it right for you to do that. 
Saul actually thought he was doing the right thing. The Bible says, King James puts it like this. Saul was still breathing threatenings. The Bible says that, that Saul held the men coats when they killed Stephen. Now Saul was consenting to his death. Saul was holding their coats. Saul was with them. Saul was urging them on. Saul was, Saul is said to have been a young man, but he was enjoying the moment. Should we enjoy the moment of somebody dying, innocent men dying, innocent people dying? There was a police department that set up a, a sting operation. But this operation was to catch bad policing. So what they did was the undercover officer was patrolling that day with another officer and the undercover officer was there out of uniform but no one knew who the second undercover officer was. So you have a man that looks like he's a U.S. citizen just driving. They pulled him over and they have a young man with them that's just fresh out of school. They pull him over and all of a sudden the experienced officer acts as if he's beating the man. The young officer just stands there and looks. And then the experienced officer looks at him and says, man, you better come over here and get you some. So the young buck goes over there and starts beating on the guy also. Guess what happens? The guy that was being beaten and the guy that pulled him over that was looking like he was beating him, it was a sting operation for this brand new officer. So here he is. He said he's going to go over and get him some too. You messed up your whole career because you're consenting. Because you are a part of it. How many times have we heard as children and how many times have we told our children, don't hang out with him. Don't spend time with her. Anybody ever heard that? Because when they drive up, they're going to take you also. So we have to understand that if we do not follow John Lewis's advice, we are just as bad. What did John Lewis say? See something, if you see something, do something. If you see something, say something. What does that mean? Doing right can be hard. I, I want to ask this question to, to one, one individual. Would you be better, would you want your legacy to read, I died as a liar? Or would you want your legacy to read, I died doing the right thing and saying the right thing? What would you want your legacy to be? What would you want your legacy to be? Would you want to die for just that moment? You would die anyway, right? Would you want to be known for that moment, for this instant that I died lying? Or would you rather die telling the truth and dying for what it's like? Yes? You do have choices, right? Now, now I always advise young people, don't go over to anybody's house complaining. Because the moment you enter their house or knock on their door, they can easily, especially in the 21st century, they can easily take you out and then you you know you fall into this, this gray area. And if you got a little tent on you, that gray area gets bigger and bigger and taller and taller and wider and wider. 
You in, you in road rage. Stay in your car. Don't get out your car. Because the gray area for you gets bigger and bigger. Paul. Paul didn't have a gray area. The Bible says Paul was consenting with the persecution, with the killing of Stephen. Paul you used to be Saul. Saul, well, let me put it this way. Let me don't blame Paul. Let me blame Saul. Why can I say that? How can I say it? Why, why am I changing from Paul to Saul? Yes, ma'am. So we need to blame, blame the old man, right? That's what Paul talks about in Romans 7. He says, ooh, this old man keep rising up. This is the picture of Paul dragging a, a dead body on his back. In the rigor mortis, the, the bacteria from the dead man begins to eat into the, the body of the live man. Paul said, oh, wretched man, oh, beaten up man, oh, burdened man that I am. Who going to deliver me? And he says, thank God for Jesus Christ. He will deliver me. Oh, wretched man that I am. Jesus will deliver me. So let me apologize to Paul. I meant Saul. Saul was consenting. The Bible says, because of this, they knew it was a heyday on Christians. It was a day that they just started, they, they just knew that it was free for all for Christians. At the death of some of our brothers and sisters in the United States, during this four year period, we knew it was not written, it was not spoken, but we knew it was a, it was a heyday for us. Can anybody identify? We knew it was open season. And when it's open season, anything goes. No control. Proverbs says it like this. When the righteous are in control, then the people rejoice. They are happy. They have great joy. But when the unrighteous are in control, it's a hard life. And the unrighteous will make it harder and harder every day. Bible said that Paul was consenting and because it was open season on Christians the people scattered. The people ran away. The people moved over. The people moved aside. But the apostles stood solid. A devout, devout man takes, takes the devout men take Stephen out and bury him gives him a decent burial they began to lament, meaning they began to have, have tears and cry over him. Because if you have any kind of heart, you don't even have to be a Christian. If you have any kind of heart, when you see somebody who's innocent die, it's going to bother you. Even the worst criminal will tell you, I don't have no remorse. But God is in control. Even the worst criminal breaks down eventually. So, so they go out and they bury him. As for Saul, he was still threatening. He was still killing. He was still beating. He was going into houses, dragging folk out. What if they stop by your house? Ask you, are you a Christian? Yes, I am. But you just saw on the news that Saul is putting folk out their houses. And Saul is coming to your house, the house that you pay for, the house that you built, the house that somebody left to you, and Saul is coming to drag you out, and he's not coming with, with soda pop. It is known, the news reporter said, that he is dragging people out and he's killing them. Will you no longer be a Christian for that moment? 
How many of you can stand under that kind of pressure and say, I'm a Christian, I'm following Jesus Christ? Is there anybody? Is there anybody who can say, I represent Jesus, I'm a born again Christian, and I am here to tell you, I'm going to always be a born again Christian. No answer is an answer within itself. So you can't escape like that. You can't say, well, you know, I'll just say nothing. You have to answer. You No answer is an answer within itself. Every Christian that I know will say, oh, I will stand and I will say it. But we got situations now that's not even that kind of pressure. And they're not saying it. Why you say that? There are people who find themselves brushing their eyes when it's time to pray over their food thing. They don't want people to know. There are people that say the quickest prayers they could ever say over their food when, they, uh, when they're around other people. And the, the more profile, high profile the meeting is, the less prayer is going on. Can you sit at the executive table when this feeding day I don't know what they call it in corporate America anymore. They have a day when they, they just feed everybody. Can you sit at the table with folks surrounding you that you have to work under and bow your head and thank God for your food? Or you just let that one go, you know, right now, God, you know, I don't, they don't want God at the, at, in, the, in the workplace, so Lord, you understand, God knows my heart. God, you know my heart. You know my heart, God. Yeah, he does. He know you're faking. You jake it. Amen. So, Saul is dragging folk out the house. Saul is committing people to prison. Saul is killing people. And here you are talking about, yeah, I'm a Christian. Yeah, I love Jesus. I'm not with that Judaism anymore. I'm with Jesus. I would like to, to tune in when it happens. See how many real, real folk that will be real with God. After Stephen is dead, Saul is pulling folk out. The word of God is spreading like wildfire. Because there are some people who are not faking it. There are some people that's willing to claim Jesus as their Lord and their Savior. There are some people that are ready to spread the word and they're going to spread the word regardless of how dangerous it is. But look at us. Two drops of rain, stop 20 Christians from coming to church. Matter of fact, I don't know about it in your church, but at our church, it doesn't have to be a drop of rain. David Tillman can say on Thursday night it's going to rain on Sunday and folks stop getting their clothes ready. I wish I could just, had a, just could have a button that I could push and turn all the news and all the weather forecasts off starting on Thursday night. People who are serious about God, they make sacrifices for God. People who really, really love the Lord, they will move like they love the Lord. I used to get calls every time the news, news reporter said, there's a storm out there. Are we gonna have Bible study tonight? Man, the storm is way 200 miles out in the ocean. Well, they said the water is going to be, be coming this way before the storm gets here. Well, it, it gets to your house before it gets to the church. Maybe you ought to be at church. My answer has been cons consistent, consistently for 31 years. We ought not look for reasons to miss church. We ought to look for reasons to go to church. We ought not look for reasons to not fellowship. We ought to look for reasons to fellowship. It's all about commitment. It's all about the word of God living in you and you demonstrating it. These first century Christians, they demonstrated the word of God. 
They stay with it. Cousin just got killed. I'm going over there to worship the Lord. Auntie Sally just got killed. I'm going. Why did she get killed? Because she was worshiping God. I'm going and I'm going to worship God. When we went over to Czech Republic, they were only 14 years removed from communism. So the police officers were still wearing uh, army fatigues. And people were still, still fearful. Because they were told all their lives when to get up, when to go, when to walk, when if they could go to church. So I'm up and I'm preaching and my interpreter uh, is going along with me and all of a sudden two guys walk in with army fatigues. When I see army fatigue, I'm like, hey, the USA Army is coming to protect us. <laughs> interpreter looks at me and says, you've got to stop. So guess what I did? I stopped. And he said some stuff in check and no one answered. The, the two of them walked out. So after church, I was like, man, what's really going on? He says, they came in and they wanted to know whose car was parked outside. You got 400 to 500 bicycles out there. And you got two cars. And the car, the drivers of the car was at the juke joint across the street. He came in and interrupted church service. Because there are people ride bicycles to church. People ride bicycles to work. But they were so fearful. And here we are, we got all the freedom we need. And some. And the freedoms that we don't have, guess what we do? We take them. So they the word of God just spread. People were preaching the word. People were teaching the word. People were witnessing to the word. It says to us tonight that whenever there are trials and tribulations, we ought to have the word of God and we ought to spread it. The Bible said the word of God multiplied. When you look at the passage where Peter preached, the Bible said Peter preached and over 3,000 souls came to know Jesus. The word of God was spread. It. In this text, people were being healed. People were confessing Christ. Philip preached Jesus Christ and a multitude with one accord <laughs> took heed of Philip's preaching. Unclean spirits in verse number 7 of Acts chapter 8. Verse number 7 says, For unclean spirits, crying with loud voices, came out of many who, who were possessed. Miracles broke out all over the place. Many who were paralyzed and lame were healed. And there was great joy in the city. There was great joy in the city. Even Simon the sorcerer, verses 9 through 13, even Simon the sorcerer came to know Jesus. What's a sorcerer? That's a sorcerer. Magic man, I mean. Okay, magic man. Anybody else? Somebody practicing witchcraft? Anybody else? Spells and charms. Spells and charms. You from Louisiana? You know something. <laughs> Spells and charms and bewitching. When I grew up in the Mississippi Delta, there was there were two that were very famous: Miss Delmar and Sister Marie. One of them, I think it was Sister Marie, stayed right there on 88 between Leland and, and, and Greenville. And when you ride through there, you see people flooding in her, her little trailer house. I, as a child, had a problem with that. I said, this woman here lives in a trailer house. All these people going to her trailer house to, to be bewitched by her, to have her tell them their story to have her dictate to them what they should do. And she living in a rundown, it wasn't just a trailer house. It was a rundown shack. 
All of her bewitching worked for everybody else, but it wasn't working for her. As a child, I was like, something wrong with this picture. I mean, something is not right here. And you have you have that that entity. Then on the other end of the spectrum, you have preachers who who preach prosperity, but they're the only ones prosperous. I said last night when I was teaching in Warden, I said, today I heard Clefo Dollar preach the best sermon I ever heard him preach in all these 40 years. He talked about grace. And he said, somebody came to him and asked, Pastor, when are we going to go on something else? When are we going to get to something else? He said, Jesus is it and Jesus alone. I said, hallelujah, he's saved. <laughs> he, says, he says that it's all about Jesus. It's all about the grace of God. And if you're going to be saved, you got to come to Jesus. And he got emotional. He started crying. He is real with it. Tears don't mean you're real, but he's real with it. And he's doing a series on it. That's the first time I ever wanted to sit and watch the whole thing. Cleflo says, he says it's by grace and grace alone. He says all about Jesus. He says if we're going to get to heaven, we're going to have to do it through Jesus Christ. I'm sitting there looking at the computer. I'm saying, preach, man, preach. Yes, man, yes. Every now and then, Sister Davis just slamming the door and going in the next room or something. That's the loudest I can get. As much as I talk at the house. I'm, I'm looking at him and I'm, I'm saying, he's taking his time. He's not telling him about prosperity. He's talking about Jesus, him crucified, him being raised from the dead. And this story, and this story alone can save you. I said, go, Pastor. Go, Pastor. Flow, Pastor. Clear flow. Flow, man. And it's, it was the best I ever, I mean, there was, he was at his best. And I'm the judge. If I'm the judge, if I see he was at his best. Wasn't making any promises. And he has even said that it's about Jesus. And if you don't have Jesus, the cars and the money and the houses don't matter. I said, Woo, good God, he saved. Same thing happened to Simon the Sorcerer. Simon the Sorcerer confessed Christ, got saved. Of Philip's preaching. The people heard it. The people took heed to it. Miracles jumped, broke out. Simon the saucer began to get saved. Then Simon the saucer did the same thing that the man that was running crazy in the graveyard did. Can I follow y'all around? He's convinced that this is the right way. He previously practiced witchcraft. He, he previously astonished the people. He amazed people. People were just so amazed at Simon the Sorcerer. He held them hostage because he knew what to do. Simon the Sorcerer gave heed. And people come to the conclusion that because he blew their mind, he was a, he was a man of great godly power. But when he took heed of Jesus, he was never the same. Now look at it now. Look at Simon the Sorcerer. He, he's doing things. He's got a great following. Don't be concerned about your following. Just stay focused on Jesus. I've said to our church several times, we may never become a mega church. But we are called to present the gospel of Jesus Christ that we will have God glorified. If we never become a mega church, let's just deal with what God has given us. It's always true for me out when a person says, oh, I like, I like the New Beginning Church because I don't like big churches. I said, well, sister, one day we may become a big church. 
People will always say what they want, what they think you want to hear. The same ones that used to like a little church, they at the big church now. Oh, I don't like, I want a pastor that I can sit down and talk to. And after they drain me, I'm going to tell you, Brother Miles, some of them can drain you, man. I mean, they can pull every juice out of you. I know what Jesus means. I felt, I felt, I felt, I felt virtue leave me. And they leave you for dead. And go on. And they leave you alone. Simon the Sorcerer. He got saved, but remember, the reason why we can't leave baby Christians to themselves is because they need nourishment. Simon the Sorcerer gets saved. Simon the Sorcerer confessed Christ as his Savior. Simon the Sorcerer, again, he means well, but Simon the Sorcerer saw Philip preaching and teaching, and he saw all these miracles break out. Guess what Simon the Sorcerer wanted to do? He wanted some of that power. He wanted some of it. He's a newborn. That's why they advise young preachers that just get saved and just start preaching. Don't get so far out there right now. Get some learning. Get, get some learning before you get your burning. <laughs> go ahead and get a little education on you. Don't just go out there and please, please, please don't let me hear you say stuff like, uh, seminary is cemetery. Don't let me hear you say, I don't need any schooling because I got the word of God. I said, you got just enough to be confused. Simon the Saucer got Jesus, and we won't get to it tonight, but when you read verses 14 through the end of this chapter, you will find out Simon the Saucer, he wanted some of that power. He want power. Let me tell you, there are false prophets and they are more concerned about power than they are about Jesus. Simon says, I tell you what, I'll pay you for that Holy Ghost. Simon said, give me some of that. I'll pay for this Holy Ghost. I'll, I'll give you some money. Guess what? He had a lot of money because a lot of people had given him money. So he paid him for it. He'll buy it. Samuel and Saul said, give, give it to me. I, I, I'll buy it. He had already astonished the people. He had already blew their minds. He had already proven that he was a great musician. A uh, musician. He was a great musician. He had done great sorceries. Can you name some of the things that we do in the present day? Not when I say me, I don't mean you. Because if I ask you what you do, you're not going to tell me. Tell me some of the things that people do that you've heard of or you've known that is strictly satanic. It's satanic, but we see it on a regular basis. What's the easy one? What's the first one? What'd you say? Who, who knows what a Ouija board is? Who, do, who doesn't know what a Ouija board is? So all y'all been dealing in the, in the occult, huh? Ouija board. Tell us about the Ouija board. Does it really take your hand around? <laughs> so, I'm going to leave this alone This ain't working Ouija board it, I, I see the symbol of people sitting in a dark room And they playing with the Ouija board and, and it's supposed to take your hand and rotate it And speak your future, something like that, right? Tarot cards Supposed to help you Read your future Palm reading Now let me tell y'all something the same palm print you got today is the same one you were born with. You don't need anybody to read it. It's there. Even if you have a twin, you have a different fingerprint. What's another one? Common ones. Horoscopes. What's a horoscope? What do they do? 
What, what's, what's the deal with heart? Why are people so fascinated with horoscopes? It produces it, 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 it predicts your future for that day or that week or something. Mm -hmm. Have anybody ever want, uh, read a bad horoscope? Do they also also offer bad horoscopes? I've never seen one, but I'm not dealing with it anyway. So, what's another one? Fortune cookies. Give, give, give it a fortune cookie, you read it, or you're going to be successful today. Has anybody read one that was bad? <laughs> no one? Every one of them positive, huh? Let me tell you, the prophets of old, they didn't predict all good stuff. Matter of fact, they predicted more bad stuff that's going to happen. If you don't get your life right, you're going to be dead in the morning. If you don't turn to God, God is going to kill you. But every single prophet of the day, they tell you how blessed you're going to be financially, how blessed you're going to be with your health. And they tell you about your children. I'm just waiting on one to say, your children are going to come back to you and you say, I ain't got no children. I'm going to just roll. I mean, that's going to be comical to me. But they, they avoid that every time, though. You know how they avoid it? They ask you, how many children do you have? Now you're in an arena with all these people and they ask you, how many children you have? You tell them. And then they start talking about, that, is, is it a boy or a girl? They boy, one, two, two boys, one girl. Oh, that boy, they, they usually they hammer on the boy because they think boys fall up. They cram up foods here before girls do. Are there any girls in the room that have crawled up Fool Hill or, or ran up Fool Hill? And so they tell you all these great things and how your prodigal going to come back home. Let me tell you a secret. This is a secret. I know it's a secret because I know church folk don't know it. The secret is every good person at one time has been a bad person. Yes? Every good person has some deep-seated stuff. And then the counselors try to tell you, get to know them first. And you spend 40 years with them and still don't know them. It's just a few of us that doesn't matter, doesn't matter, it doesn't matter what we've done. We, we're not gonna let we're not gonna let it uh, taint our relationship anyway. On Sunday, Pastor, Pastor Daniel was preaching, Pastor, Pastor Rose. Uh, 51st anniversary, and he talked about a boy and a girl. Of course, they're always Johnny and Mary, you know. And he said, Johnny threw a rock and broke the window. Broke broke the mama's vase, took the glass vase. And then when they went in the house, Mary said, that, uh, you're going to have to wash those dishes. So mama said, who's washing the dishes? Mary walks over to Johnny and said, you know I saw what you did. So Johnny washed the dishes. Mama says, next day, who's going to mop the floor? Mary walks up to Johnny. And Mary says, you know what you did with Mama's face. So Johnny mopped the floor. So one day, Johnny got sick and tired of Mary holding it over her, his head. So he went in the house, said, Mama, I need to confess something. Mama, I need to tell you something. I'm the one that broke the vase. And guess what Mama said? I was looking out the window. When you broke the vase, I saw you had already broken the vase. I knew you had broken the vase. I was just going to see how long it's going to take for you to come and confess that you broke the vase. When it comes to God, God already sees what we've done. He already knows what we've done. He knows we broke the vase. All we got to do is go to him and he will forgive us for it. Simon and Sarsen trying to buy some Holy Ghost. The other said, look, you need to make sure you get it right with God. This is not for purchase. You got to get it right with God. And the only way to get it right with God is trust Jesus. His death, his burial, his resurrection from the dead. If you've never trusted Jesus as your Savior, this is your moment. 
Believe the story that he died on a skull hill called Calvary. Believe that he rose from the dead and believe that he got up for you and for me. And that same Jesus that stood up on the right hand of the Father is sitting on the right hand of the Father, wanting you to confess unto God that he can forgive you. If you've never received Jesus as your Savior, bow your head with me and invite him into your life. Just say these simple words. Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you rose from the dead. come into my life and make me a new person. Thank you for saving my soul. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We believe that if you honestly pray this prayer welcoming Jesus into your life, we believe that you're now born again and you're on your way to heaven. We believe that God and the angels are welcoming you. So go ahead and attach yourself to a good group of Bible-believing believers. I recommend the New Beginning Church where you can attend globally or you can attend locally. New Beginning Church, 4251 Shuramai Road, Houston, Texas. Shuramai is spelled S-C-H-U-R-M-I-E-R. 4251 Shuramai Road, Houston, Texas, 77048. Thank you for joining us. Please join us again for Bible study on Wednesday night at 7.15. Join us on Sunday morning for, for Sunday school at 9 a.m. Or join us and join us Sunday morning at 10.30 a.m. for our worship service. Thank you so much for being a part of our service. It is offering time. It is time to give to the Lord through tithes, offering, and sacrificial gifts. If you want to give electronically, you can do so by Zelle. Our Zelle account is lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. If you want to mail in your gift, you can do so by mailing it to P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. That is P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for being part of our service. Father God, we thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to give. We thank you for money. We thank you for jobs. We thank you for income and increase. We ask you to bless us as we give. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And thank God. I have two announcements. On Sunday, we're asking all of you to come out and join us as we set up the sanctuary for the summer enrichment camp, set up the sanctuary fellowship hall in the classroom, 5 p.m. this Sunday. We're gonna rearrange the whole building so young people can come and enjoy the summer enrichment camp. This year, the camp will sponsor music, hydroponics, and acuponics. So please come and be a part. If you cannot uh, volunteer, come on out Sunday evening, Sunday afternoon at 5 p.m. We'll be glad to help you and you will be, we'll be glad that you've come to help us. Amen. For the second quarter, the first quarter, or the second quarter of your Bible listening and journaling, please text Sister Davis if you, you have finished the first quarter, or you have finished the second quarter, or you have finished both quarters. Please text Sister Davis and let her know. We are halfway through the Bible. We are Bible listeners, and we are halfway through the Bible. We want to make sure that if you have completed either the first quarter or the second quarter, uh, text us to Davis and let her know so you can be awarded this coming Sunday. If you are a global listener and you are with us and, and traveling through the Bible with us, please text us to Davis or myself and let her know uh, that uh, let us know that you have completed these uh, quarters. Amen. Amen.
Amen. It is time to give to the Lord. And we're so glad that God has given us a chance. Father, we thank you for these gifts. We thank you for blessing us. We thank you, Father God, for every person who has given. In Jesus' name we pray. Now unto him who is able to keep us from falling, unto him the all wise and only true God, true God, unto him be power, glory, and dominion. Until we meet again, let us join each other by saying, Amen. Amen. You are dismissed. Yeah.